every building is better in some way than when we inherited it. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I am your host, Ryan Willard. And today I have the great privilege of conversing with Andy Matthews, the visionary founder and director of the Andy Matthews Studio. So Andy harbors an unyielding dedication to advancing the expertise, service offerings and methodologies of an architect. As he candidly puts it, I really give a shit. Um, Harnessing a blend of pragmatism and technical prowess, Andy approaches his craft with an insatiable curiosity and ingenuity, enhancing value at every stage of the design journey, from the inaugural sketch to troubleshooting on on-site complications. So it was really great speaking with Andy. I think one of the things that was very exciting for me was that it's a uh, you know the Andy Matthews Studios. It's a a, a relatively young practice. Um, they've already in, you know, been involved in a number of fantastic uh, residential projects. Um, they've got some beautiful work in the retail sector, working with high-end brands um, and creating quite experiential environments. I mean, Andy in his career has spearheaded num- a number of different types of projects, encompassing housing, educational infrastructure, retail refurbishments, galleries, museums, workspaces. So a real kind of breadth of experience that Andy and his team are bringing to the business. And as a young practice, they are implementing a lot of very innovative techniques or business ideas, one of them being the four-day working week, um, which for some companies has proved to be very successful. Um, And Andy seems to be making it work very well for them um, for them um we talk about working from home again other other practices haven't been able to make this work so well other practices really thrive on it so i don't think there's a right or a wrong answer here but we talk to andy about how they make it work within their own business and how they're able to kind of leverage other things such as outsourcing um using freelancers, being really up to speed with technology. I mean, this is what I like to see, a kind of micro practice that's implementing and, you know, being lean and mean and lightweight and having a degree of flexibility internally so that they can keep uh, an efficient machine operating. So this is really fantastic conversation. Um, Andy brings a very kind of diligent and thoughtful uh, response to all of the questions here. And there's loads and loads of gold. So sit back, relax and enjoy the fantastic Andy Matthews. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Andy, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Pleasure to have you on the show. So, thank you. Thanks for having me. You are the founding director of Andy Matthews Studio. Um, you guys ha- have got a beautiful portfolio of work, residential, and there's a lot of kind of high end retail or kind mm-hmm. of artisan boutique types of shops that you've been very stylishly um, designing and working with some pretty interesting brands. Um, you guys, how long have you guys been in operation for? Uh, I guess we've been going about two and a half years, um, a little bit, a little bit outside of that, you know, part-time, but full, full-time for about two and a half years. So. Great. Great. And so you've, and you've had a, a career previously to this, you've worked at Rick Mather Architects and Pitman Tozer and, um, and other places. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I feel like I learned my craft there and, um, especially at Rick Mather there for nine years and it felt like a bit of an apprenticeship if you like amazing any any lessons that you learned from rick mather architects in terms of the running a practice or stand out so so many (laughs) we'd have to have a separate chat about that one but um i think yeah i mean rick was a real character a real force for um doing things uh so much so that we we had a lot of rickisms that he um I can't repeat them all. Um, but, you know, there was, there was lessons like no meetings before 11 or after four and so on. So 
uh, and you know allow a beer or a gin and tonic from after six and so on. So it was quite a it was it was a really really fun place to work uh, at that point in my life as well. So. Brilliant. And what was it that had you then set up the Andy Matthews Studio? That's a really interesting question actually because I never thought I wanted to set up on uh, you know a, a, a practice really, and I always thought I'd probably work in in practice with others and as part of that team. And I think, uh, I mean, there's so many cliches coming here. So uh, do write them all down for your bingo card. I mean, turning 40 was a huge thing. Um, uh, The pandemic can coincide with that, working at home. And I think there was a little bit of a kind of, if not now, then when. Mm. Uh, You know, it's just, you know, I mean, the pandemic, I mean, we seem to have moved on and forgotten about it. But at its its darkest moments, it was, uh, we could all be dead tomorrow. So why not just give it a go? Yeah. (laughs) So uh, there was, um, and that sounds a bit nihilistic potentially, but I think uh, let's give it a go. Probably get another job if it doesn't work out. Let's 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 have a go. Was it something that you you that you kind of had clients prepared and ready, or was it more? Uh, well, I mean, we had a bit of an overlap. I did speak to my boss uh, at Air Chamberlain, Gaunt, Matt, who was very supportive, um, and you know, I said there's a bit of a three year pathway, and we can start talking to people and easing my way out, and so on. But that got that got compressed quite quickly when we started talking to people and trying to win work. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, we stopped saying no. So, uh, you know, opportunities have, have, have landed or, or come to us over the years. But we've often said, I'm sorry, I'm too busy with practice. I can't service that. So it was very much about opening oneself to work that was out there and, 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 and actually just telling anybody who would listen that we were looking for work, I think. So, so at the very beginning, you know, you're setting up a practice in the middle of covid basically, mm. which mm. on the surface of it seems like a crazy idea. But actually, for a lot of architects, there was an enormous amount of residential work. And there was a couple of sectors, yeah. you know, anything that wasn't hospitality was actually doing fairly well. What was your sort of strategy at the beginning? Well, I, I'd love to say there was a strategy, <laughs> but the only strategy was, was go and get work. But um, to answer your question, I guess most people were thinking about how they uh, exist in their own home environments, if you see what I mean. So, you know, that became a very, very core kind of thing that people think about because they'd all spent so much time there, hadn't they, really? So any little problems or niggles that they, you know, might have just got around with for a while suddenly became very problematic for them and, and adapting what they had became such a big, big market, I think, really. Mm-hmm. And f- were you, basically, was it just you as an independent or did you so, quickly I- kind of, you know, have other people involved? Yeah, so we started with a business partner um, who we've, we've since moved away from each other and, um, and we both see that as a positive thing. Um, we've employed staff, we've grown, uh, we've reduced a little bit um, and I guess all those things, we've learned lessons through those through those steps really. Um, but ultimately, I think personally, I want to get to a point where somewhere around 10 to 12 people in the studio grow organically. Mm-hmm. Um, I think talking to the guys at 3144 Architects, they said, that they'd grown rather nicely by having one or two people join each year. And it was kind of considered growth. Yeah. Um, and I think by the time you get to around about that size, maybe 12 people, you've got, hopefully it's self-sustaining. You've got a client base, you've got an office manager maybe, and, you know, a few more people at different levels. And, and it feels a bit more like a grown up organization potentially. Yeah. Well, and then there's certainly these kind of levels as well of like of, of difficulty with the, with the amount of people. And then it becomes easier when you've got a kind of magic, magic number. So yeah, like, yeah. The, the it's management, isn't it? Unfortunately, you know that you, you, I've gone from management to doing, and then management again, and it's always very hard as an architect to step away from that doing yeah. and, and trusting others to do it. So, um. brilliant. So, and one of the innovations that you've employed recently, and has this been from the from the outset of the business of the four day work week? Yeah, I, I mean that wasn't actually my idea. I have to credit um, James, my previous business partner, with it, and. Um, I'll admit, fully admit, I was resistant to it. Um, I can be a bit of a workaholic. Yeah, uh, I love work. Getting things done is is what I enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually, uh, there's more to life than just work. I think mm-hmm. um, uh, breaking news for all architects out there. Um, but it, it's uh, when we employed our first um, member of staff, Samita, who joined us about uh, about eighteen months, two years ago now. Um, we decided that everybody who we employed would be on a four day week, 32 hours, no loss of pay. Uh, and when we say no loss of pay, we have benchmarks against various um, surveys and so on. Um, and we kind of thought, oh, we'll always do five days. You know, just everybody else do it. And 
that in martyr kind of way of thinking about it. But actually, two weeks in, we're like, no, 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 come on, <laughs> we're not doing this. We're not sitting in the studio on a Friday. Um, that's ridiculous. So, so from there, we've you know we've grown and, and and hopefully made a bit of a success of it, really. Fantastic. And and so, what what sorts of things did you need to consider in order to be able to have a four day work week operational? How does it deal with the clients? Is it everybody takes the same day off? Or yeah. Is it so that that yeah. Rules? So we need you know we need to communicate a lot of clarity around it really, and a lot of the questions are well you know shouldn't you spread it out so someone's always in the studio, and my response to that has always been well it's always going to be the wrong person do you know what I mean? So um, you can guarantee that the person taking the message is the person who's not be able to answer that query and so on. So yeah. we're very clear about it in our messaging. It's on our email signatures in our contracts and so on. Um, but, you know, we do expect a little bit of flexibility from our staff in terms of you might have to answer an email on a Friday. Mm-hmm. I don't want you doing any work. I don't want you going and finding other opportunities to work if, if you know, our salary should be enough so that you're able to rest. Um, and I think it's it's really important we do that. We rest, mm-hmm. uh, go to galleries, look at art, culture, and actually have some downtime, go to the post office, whatever it is, really. And come back and work hard and go home again, really. So, so, so the, the, the day is like a, a complete day off, go off and do something that's nurturing and enriching to yourself. None of my business, but I just, I, ideally, I'd, I'd, I'd love that you don't work. Um, you know, it, it's, ultimately, it's none of my business. But it's, it's the intent behind it is that please rest, recover, spend time walking the dog, your partner, whatever, or um, it's entirely up to you. Um, it does make a lot of things easier, like, going to the post office, taxing the car, all, all those kind of things that mm-hmm. the dentist, the doctor, all that kind of stuff. And I think it's, it's right that we have that extra time to ourselves so that yeah. hopefully we can come back a bit more creative and, uh, and a bit more enthused for another work week. Amazing. So I know that you guys um, are online for becoming a B Corp as well. <laughs> Working towards that, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've done our first assessment and, and need to put some things in place to finish that off. And, uh, yeah, sorry. And and does does the work from home? I mean, does the um the four day work week kind of tie in nicely with some of the requirements of things that you're being assessed about for? Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't actually. Oh, it doesn't. <laughs> you know, in, in terms of values, yes, it's it's in the right kind of path, but but there's no actual um, tick I think in there which which rewards something like that. Um, our Gina, who we're working with, who's who's absolutely brilliant, has has put that question up to the to mm-hmm. the kind of what they call the B leaders team in the UK. Um, but at present, I don't think there's anything that rewards it. But um, you know, in terms of values and a way of working, I think it, it it goes hand in hand. Really. Yeah. Do do you find that having a four a four day working week means that you know those days are much more the four days you have in the office are much more intense, or you've got to be a lot more carefully curated or planned? How do, you, how do you get people to still produce the, I mean, are people still producing the same levels of, of work? We get a lot of stuff done. Yeah, I think we do. Um, uh, to be fair, we don't have anything to benchmark against because we've right. grown organically into the system. So um, I would also say I have the utmost respect to anybody's changed an organization into this system. Um, but in terms of our week, it, it can be quite intense. You know, mm-hmm. we, we try not to work more than eight, eight and a half hours a day. Mm-hmm. Um, but we do a lot of planning um discussion communication to make sure we hit the things that we need to hit that week and 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 the thing that i think about the most is that actually is that it exposes other things in your business that aren't going very well Mm -hmm. and ultimately it's not the savior you know it'll it'll strip very bare that your resourcing isn't done very well your cash flow is very poor all those kind of things it will show that immediately because ultimately it's very easy to use that extra fifth day to cover all of that. And as soon as you remove all of that um, float, potentially, you've got to be pretty on it to, to make it work. So, so what sorts of automations or tools or processes have you been leveraging to ensure that, you know, all the things that need to get done, get done from your marketing, your sales to your kind of financial administration so, I mean, pre- in previous roles in practice, I've, I've been the IT manager, um, run systems, all these kind of things. Perfect. Um, I guess 2009 was another recession. You know, uh, our current downturn is not my first rodeo. So, you know, being adaptable and doing those other things has got me a bit of an interest in those. So one of the goals we set out when we started the practice was do things properly day one. And 
And that involves a lot of quite boring stuff, I guess. So email filing, document management, mm -hmm. those kind of things. Because I don't think anybody should be filling out Excel sheets or doing stuff manually when a computer can do things for you. And we're not as using technologies as far as we should be, but you know, the aspiration is there. So, so we have a full document management system, email filing, project email addresses, all linked into Microsoft teams and records and everything there. And it costs us about a grand a year. Right. So it's absolutely nothing, you know, so why shouldn't we do that? Yeah. Um, things like timesheets and those kind of things we need to improve, but we do do it. We look at, um, uh, resourcing and those kind of things. The next thing is to get into a bit more process based systems in terms of each stage has got a very, very clear outline of what we need to do. Um, but at the same time, there's a balance, isn't there between creativity and process and it don't really want to kill everything through process. Yeah. Um, and, and in terms of leads, um, I've talked many times about the fact that I absolutely love my capsule CRM mm -hmm. and I track all our business leads through there or our contacts, the contacts are our lifeblood of our business. So, uh, it's sensible that we, you know, track all that and manage that really. What, what kinds of, um, activities are you doing to generate leads to keep the business fed? Talking to anyone I can, I think, um, uh, there is a bit more structure to it. Um, at one point, 70% of our work came through cycling it or not so <laughs> <laughs> the idea that it's the new golf is is probably fair um but that still happens and those conversations that come from a bike or weekends away with people um still generate work um and i think there's there's a camaraderie that comes from the bicycle i think there's also a a, a potential uh, easier way of, of engaging with people so us being face to face can be quite um, intense. Yeah. You notice that I look away occasionally to give myself a bit of a break. But obviously, mm -hmm. if you're on a bike, you're sat next to each other. You're not looking at each other. You're you're kind of riding as a pair. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to have a conversation and um, and build that rapport, which then turns into business afterwards. I think. So. Right. And 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 you find that there's quite a good, decent caliber of different industries and professionals that engage in the world of cycling, or is it easy to get trapped with kind of other architects? Or that's a very good point. Yeah. So so riding to cycle to Cannes in 2018, uh, you couldn't move for structural engineers. So um, <laughs> that's great. But you know, I want to try and find a few clients in there somewhere. Having said that, some of our structural engineers have turned into clients. So yeah. you know, I think it's 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 just talk to anyone build, build your brand through that really. Um, but obviously as we try and grow, we need to be a bit more targeted in terms of pitching to the right people. Uh, and I've just been pleasantly surprised that most people will go for a coffee with you and give you four to five minutes of their time. Yeah. Um, you know, not as a hard sell, but just to catch up. And then maybe 18 months later, there might be another meet and you, and you catch up again. So in terms of the, the work that you like, and enjoy to pursue the most what are the sorts mm. of sectors that are for you the kind of bread and butter work and then for you the growth sectors where you think if we actually got a really strong foothold here then mm. this could actually make the you know it could it could provide a lot more longevity and sustainability for the business yeah i mean i think i have a very poor answer to this and i'm still trying to work out of it but ultimately we're interested in anything that we can solve a problem and, and that's not sector based unfortunately um, that's also to do with just being interested in doing lots of things and being creative. Mm -hmm. Um, however, to answer your question, residential has been very good to us. We've also been, uh, had a very, very, um, you know, engaged client with our tracksmith project. You know, they've, they've absolutely supported our business and helped us grow. Um, but I think in terms of growth for the business, uh, I think I'd love to get some workspace, um, work a bit more. We have had a few leads on there. Yeah. And I think more residential retrofit, but also when I talk about workspace, we'd like to improve the envelopes of buildings as well as doing the fit out potentially. So, so we've got experience there and, you know, we've just actually had some carbon calcs on a project, uh, a residential project. We've reduced the energy efficiency, sorry, improved the energy efficiency in the bills by 50%. So, um, I think some of those projects that may not be quite as glamorous, um, but have a really, really meaningful impact uh, are probably a kind of base thing that we we would love to keep going with. And it's a big issue in the UK at the moment in terms of uh, EPCs and upgrading existing um, workspace fabric. Mm -hmm. And whether that's for, as workspace or as another function or another use, really. Yeah.
In, in terms of the, the the approaches between going after residential work and commercial work, obviously with mm. small practice, um, you know, residential work is often the kind of bread and butter stuff. It's the lifeblood. It's also mm. an opportunity to be able to demonstrate design flair and design thinking and thought and yeah you know, nowadays there's lots of platforms to kind of get get published but then we have the other problem with depending on which area of the sector you're working if you're working with the kind of ultra high net worth individuals then mm. there's often opportunity for lots of repeat work it might not be yes. it might not be the taste of the particular practice though mm. um the kind of more middle market tends to be great opportunity but then very difficult in terms of that recurring workflow or how, how do you manage that and then and balance it again with kind of yeah. working with more commercial um well working with other businesses really well they're, i mean they're, they're two very different offers we have different portfolios and, and we pitch those people in very different ways but we mm -hmm. you know one common thread is value between there so i mean as, as, you, as you alluded to a residential client that may be their one and only project they ever do in their life yeah and you know that's that's extraordinarily stressful for them uh you know, and can be hugely rewarding as well, obviously, at, at, at the end and when they pass it and enjoy that space. Um, but I think residential is probably a good component that always should take up some of our work because you're solving problems for people. You can you can build experience on um, smaller projects uh, for, for architects, running jobs and, and traditional contracts and so on, and seeing the full gamut of things without, let's say, doing a door schedule for a year. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So... Very, very broad experience. Um, and, and there's another architect who said that they would, they, I can't remember who it was now, um, but she said, you know, we always keep doing loft extensions because it means a part two student can do, run a project. So, mm -hmm. um, but in terms of bidding to other workspace, uh, sorry, the other, you know, more commercial things, we, I mean, I've got a portfolio that stretches back over 20, 25 years. Not all of it appears on our website, but obviously when we go and meet those people, there's a there's a far bigger range of, of projects up to about 35, um, like even 60 million in Oxford. So, um, some of those I've played a smaller part on. Some of those we, we've run. But then the other thing as well is that when we speak to residential clients, we also say, well, hold on, we've done all this really big work and we understand process, and we're quite unique because we're able to then apply those bigger things to a smaller project. We haven't just grown on those projects. So, um, I guess probably what I'm trying to say is that they are both helpful and, and that they can kind of work together really right they kind of feed off each other and there's a, yeah, there's a knowledge so. base that develops inside yeah. of the the practice yeah. which becomes i think so and and residential clients can go on to become commercial clients as well you know so um in in terms of growing the practice and kind of adding these key team members in how have you how has that happened has it been like a, an, a, a more more reactive process when there's just been too much work on then you've decided to hire or mm. and again the other thing that many small practices have the challenge with is that on the surface of it, it often makes sense it makes sense to hire a part two for example because you can pay them less essentially right they're they're, they're cheaper and they can learn etc cetera, etc cetera. And mm. then, but then the, the issue for a smaller practice is now you have to spend the practice owner has to spend an awful lot of time in training and teaching that person and whilst it can be very fulfilling and like a lovely wonderful thing to do yeah from a business perspective it can be really precarious uh, yeah there's a balance in there and, and i think we probably have got that wrong potentially and i think um obviously i think when we employed our first member of staff we should have got someone more experienced i think yeah um that leap in salaries as, as you as you've noted is 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 important because it, it gets you um more experience and, and and the ability to do more things with less supervision but i mean ultimately we want to have a role in the industry where we can support part one students mm -hmm. and, and bring those into the studio but i think when there's four of us it, it, it's very hard to support that and i think generally we would favour more experienced people and, and paying a bit more for that, really, um, and giving them more autonomy. And then as we grow, those other those other levels coming coming through. If you see what I mean, yeah. Um, well, that, but it is it is a challenge. Well, that, that's that's interesting actually. Like as a sort of a business um, kind of aspiration is to be able to be a business that supports and nurtures talent mm. from from like a from like an early age from what's like you know like a kind of like a football team does you yeah know, taking, yeah taking people out of part ones and having that relationship but it's it's quite a long-term game and the business needs to be 
it need, we need to, there needs to be some sort of markers or like performance markers for the business to be able to, to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, and, and it's made even harder by doing the four day week. We've set ourselves up as a, uh, you know, we have to be efficient. We have to make the money. We have yeah. to make the profit to do the nice things that we want to do. Um, and, and, you know, we generally do want to support those things. I, I think it's, it's, people supported us but i also don't think you should employ people and then just having somebody sat there doing renders for a year sure because i'd rather pay a person who enjoys that you know so if we are going to employ someone that they get a rounded experience they get the right experience but we're in the right place to do that and support them sort of. yeah yeah no abs- absolutely in terms of the kind of being efficient with the four day working mm. week um and kind of setting yourself aspirations and, and and goals. I'm imagining as well that this is actually quite an appealing thing for lots of um, team members to be working on that kind of, of to be working in that kind of that manner. Um, do you find as well that it helps culturally align with potential clients? Oh yeah, that's a good yeah. I mean, there's there's lots of levels in that. I mean, the first point of that is that it, it helps with with uh, staff attraction. Mm-hmm. So you know, um, you're already elevating your catchment kind of size of people who want to apply to you. Um, and obviously, word gets around if if a place is not nice to work for. Um, obviously, there's there's more than the four day week. We still have to be a pleasant, interesting place to work on time. Yeah, I mean that comes back to our B Corp thing, doesn't it? Really, and I think the thing about B Corp is it gets you into a bit of a club. Yeah. If we're being really, really honest about it. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, all the stuff is great and it's not actually an environmental certification. It's got four or five strands and, you know, lots of business processes we can do. And it's very appealing because it's people, planet, profit. So run a good business to do the good stuff. Yeah. Um, But there's five B Corp developers in the UK, I think, that gets you an immediate, I'm going to talk to you because, you know. Yeah. Uh, I've got a project manager, Martin, who we're about to work with. He said he went to an interview and said, someone gave him a sustainability question. They said, oh, we're B Corp. said, okay, fine. The CEO just said, yeah, got it. No problem. You got the job. Um, yeah, it's really, it's really yeah. kind of walking the talk, isn't it, with the B Corp? It's no, it's no I think easy, so, yeah. No, it's not an easy accreditation to obtain. Yeah, I think it has a bit of a journey to go and it needs to evolve and it needs to improve. Um, mm. um, and, and rightly so. Um but I think that cultural alignment is really important. And we started with a bit of a loose kind of good things for good people. We don't talk about that externally anymore. But I think there's a very important point there about working with people who want to work with you. And if they don't want to work with you, there's lots of other architects who do. Um, you know, so friction and you know, projects are hard. Don't get me wrong. I'm not being naive. But ultimately, if somebody really wants to work with you and you really want to work with them, there's some good buildings to be made as a result of that. Yeah. And, you know, we have a massive part in the process, but clients are the one who help us get good buildings, you know, their support, their tenacity, their drive and their way forward. And you know, and their support ultimately uh, is what gets good buildings made, really. Um, fairly crude way of saying it, but. Well, how do you, how do you know when to say no to a client? What are the, what are their kind of, you know, mm. flag <laughs> that you're like, nope, this is. You know, because I, I guess, I guess, in one way, one of the you know, a red flag might be you having the foresight to be able to identify a client where you know, you know, they're not going to, you know, the, the four day working week just they won't accept it. For example, I mean, uh, I, of I, course, I imagine yeah. quite a few people that would be. I suspect so. Be like that, but <laughs> yeah. you yeah. could imagine um, some sort of crazed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, and I, th- I think that's fine. You know, so there may be a little bit of adapting. that. I, well, I don't think so. Actually, if they weren't supportive of that, I don't think we would be able to work with them. So on some side, you could see that as a very poor business decision. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> you've reduced your market incredibly quickly. The other way of looking at it is that you've really focused your market and you know who yeah. your market is and you can drill down on that and know Absolutely. exactly who wants yeah. to talk to yeah. you. Um, so whilst I've talked about what we want to do in terms of maybe being a bit of a generalist, Mm-hmm. Who we want to do it with is, you know, we're laser focused on that. You know exactly who we want to work with. Um, but these things aren't black and white. And my, my old boss said to me the other day, you know, Andy, all these ethics are great, uh, summarizing slightly. But if you follow the money, it always goes to oil. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So where, where does that go? And where are the boundaries and where are the gray zones? So, you know, are we working for an oil company, but improving 
I don't know, their um, their cafe for people. Is that acceptable? Where does that sit on the line? So mm -hmm. um, are we doing something in the Far East uh, with a very poor human rights record, but we're doing a school for young women? I, I don't know. But, you know and these, these things very much aren't black and white. No, and um, and my friend Sinead Connealy did a really good podcast on that. And I think it was much more eloquent than I, I can be, I think so. Well, I mean, it's like, it's like a company like BP is a, is a B Corp certified, you know, BP, the pet petroleum company is a B Corporation mm. itself and some other big corporations yeah. are. And it's, I, I think it's, that becomes, you know, there is an internal compass that we have to have with A, with individuals mm. and who we're working with and also kind of company missions. And then also the, the industry that a company or person is working in. Like where, mm. do you, where do we make judgments around around that? And I think it becomes it's it's like it's like you say it's not black and white. It, it's also much much harder when you you could do with a bit of work, you know. Absolutely. You know, so you know, okay, got a bit of a hole in the cash cash flow forecast. It's quite tempting to plug that in with um, someone we don't you know don't feel quite as comfortable with. So, mm -hmm. uh, and it's about holding your nerve, I think, as well. So um, it's it's very hard, I think. What, what what kind of conversations do you have with the team about the types of projects that you take on? Is it very much that you you kind of go out and win the work and everybody's normally very happy with the type of projects that you bring in? Or is there ever a discussion, you know, I'm looking at this project and kind of ethically, perhaps the team are like, nope, we're not going to do that. Yeah, I mean, this did happen recently and I talked to the team about it and I, I said, yeah, this doesn't feel quite right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to be specific about it. You might not agree with my choice, but okay. but actually, I I was probably being too hard, and they were saying, "Well, this seems okay because of this, this, and this." Mm -hmm. um, and the other kind of thing was, "Well, we could put in a larger fee and give and make sure we make a profit on it clearly, but you know, give half of that profit to Greenpeace or something." So, mm -hmm. is that is, is there a Robin Hood element to that? You know, the cash yeah. is there, kind of take it you. for God's sake. Yeah, maybe. Um, I, I'm sure I'll get flack for that. Maybe, you know, but. Um, can't remember quite what we decided with that one. I don't think it moved ahead. But anything that's a border case or a margin, I, I would definitely ask. I think yeah. because you know our team have to be happy doing that. You know? Yeah. Um, we all need to get paid. We want to get our salaries and all that, and we need to invest for the future. But we, I think, we all need to be able to sleep comfortably at night that we haven't um, done something awful. Yeah. No. Ab absolutely. And I, th I think knowing your own company values and kind of being mm. clear on clear on those and at least having them expressed in some kind of way or at least you know kind of actively discussed gives us a little bit of a, a guiding north star if you like of yeah and making sure they evolve actually you know they're continually reviewed and thought about because it just everything moves so quickly progress in terms of what's thought of acceptable or or language or uh, um, sustainability or technology all sorts it, it's um it's got to be reviewed constantly it's dynamic i think well, well, this is another interesting, uh, you know, question or kind of area that architects are dealing with at the moment is being able to enroll, you know, influential clients and builders mm -hmm. into their role and responsibility in terms of sustainability. And this becomes a, you know, it's a, it's still one of these things where we know it's massively important. There's lots of kind of impending mm -hmm. um, planetary changes that are happening that may be irreversible um but being able to enroll people you know clients on the surface level people can be very interested in, in it but then when it comes down to cry cash that's a lot more <laughs> than we wanted to pay for that right now yeah um that becomes very very difficult how, how do you navigate this and you know how do you kind of sell effectively really sustainability to clients I mean, I think a, a, a core level, a principle level, every building is better in some way than when we when we inherited it. And, you know, a lot of our work is is with existing fabric. So, you know, you don't always have to talk about all the insulation you're putting in potentially. But, um, you know, as an aspiration, yes, we should be doing that. Um, and I think there's a bit of an issue I've talked about with a couple of people is that there's a danger of seeing every building has to be perfect mm. in terms of sustainability and environmental point of view. And I think it's a bit of a dangerous game because actually constant and incremental improvement is probably more effective in, in terms of what you do. Um, I mean, I think hopefully clients will come to us anyway because we're doing that, but also we're pitching to the right clients who are more on board with it. But I mean, I did, I did go to a, a seminar the other day, I think it was with Symmetries Engineers, 
Um, but but ultimately, we're talking to the enlightened people in the room. Yeah. What what's the point? <laughs> you know, because yeah. we you know we're all just slapping ourselves on the back, thinking this is great. You know. But actually, we're point zero point zero one percent of the people who are developing projects in London. Mm-hmm. So, how does this get to the masses? And is that through uh, policy? So, you know, or is, you know, or is it through um, developers wanting to do well? And I think it's a it's a mixture of policy. But actually, what's really rewarding at the moment is that a lot of this stuff makes financial sense now. Mm-hmm. You know, because we've had the energy price shock and um, those kind of things, and if somebody's you know, going to buy a big office, they want to know how much it's going to cost to run. If someone's buying a big eight, uh, five, six bedroom house. How much is it going to cost me this winter? You know, so there's, there's very obvious financial considerations, which now are starting to bring this into a much more, um, well, I might as well just invest in this. Yeah. yeah so, so there's a, a good, strong economic argument that we're able to kind of engage in. Yeah, I think so. And, and I, I'm not, okay, I'm quite left-wing. I'm not always like, well, the market will solve it. Sure. But in, interestingly, it does seem to be that the market can solve it. Maybe if given the right prompts, I think is probably a, a fair way of describing it. Yeah. In in terms of uh, developing good working relationships with, you, you know, speaking there about working with engineers, mm. um, what, what have been some of your challenges, um, certainly as a, as a smaller and a newer practice, developing relationships with um, other consultants? Have you found that you were able to bring a lot of working relationships from previous uh, employments or previous positions that you held? And yeah. them, or have you kind of had to start afresh because it's a different, you know, you're working in different sectors? No, I mean, we've got some brilliant consultants we work with. Um, I mean, if we take structure engineers, I mean, I've got so many that are amazing. Um, we have to kind of choose which one's right for each job. But sometimes on some of the residential things, people see structure engineering as a binary thing, either works or it doesn't. And, you know, you know, the people we work with are very creative. Um, we've got a brilliant MEP guy who used to work at a global organization and I've worked with him for about 15 years. He still helps us on little ret- residential retrofits, you know, with very small fees. Um, and we've got this huge collection of consultants, which is absolutely brilliant. The bit where we struggled with is finding the contractors. That's right. the bit that wasn't in our network actually. And right. that's taken the bit to kind of grow and, and kind of come through really. Um, but our consultants are brilliant and, and we know which ones we want to work with on each job. And, and like I say, some of them have actually become clients as well. So. How how did you kind of resolve the finding and 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 how do you work with contractors? Because this is also a very interesting kind of um, particularly in in the domestic residential mm. sector because mm. contractors it's... can be you know there's a kind of small outfit and then there's massive outfits and then there's not, there's not always the, the the kind of soft you need in the middle and yeah be there's a... the laissez faire approach and then it's like well. Uh, you haven't built it how we drew it and stuff, but you know, the clients loves them. Uh, yeah. Or there's the kind of very processed people and everything's an extra. And I think it's, again, it, like all these things, it comes down to personalities and people that you that work with, you know, the good people that you get on with. And ultimately we always sometimes need to take a bit of a view on things don't we? so, you know, we're not giving stuff away for free, but it's like, okay, we could ask for extras all the time or whatever, but we're in the business of getting things done and we want to work with people who, get things done with us, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, not cause roadblocks to that along the way. Um, I hope I, that, that's in a collaborative sense, not in a kind of sure. don't, don't bring me any problems. But are, 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 you, are you working with contractors in a kind of traditional sense where you're using a traditional contract and you're going through a tender, a tender process? At, you know, yeah. Quite yeah, a generally, of drawings. yeah, generally through a, 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 quite a, a traditional process and then managing that through... Um, uh, proper contract administration on site, um, but obviously experience of DMB previously. Um, but it's cumbersome, you know, it, there's a lot of process that needs to happen on small domestic work to, to make that work. And if, if somebody does want a full service, it can quite, get quite expensive for them because there is simply quite a lot to do. Yeah. Um, but I think the other thing that we, we have experimented with a couple of times is, is negotiation mm-hmm. and, you know, finding the right people, ultimately the, the, the materials and are going to cost what they're going to cost. Yeah. Um, and the only difference then is, do you get on with them? Do you want to work with them? The overheads and profit and their attitude, really. And that's a very uh, <laughs> you know, high level way of looking at it. But with it, with it, you, So you mean like a kind of negotiated tender where you're, you invite a contractor in very early on 
they're your kind of preferred and then they're yeah. involved with sort of pricing from the outset and it's that's pretty right. much yeah. a given that that's they're they're getting the job yeah and obviously that removes that removes the commercial aspect of you know competition yeah um but you know that that can be a successful relationship it has to be quite careful there, i think yeah um but i think there's also a point of trying not to waste too many people's time um and obviously if somebody's very busy they're not going to price it very well or they're going to price it you know very very high and if we get it they, they make a huge profit um but it's it's um we spend a lot of time reconciling those things and, and balancing those things out and reporting ultimately risk to our clients yeah i think that's very uh, that's very interesting i mean i'm personally i like the idea of the negotiated tenders because you know when i speak mm. to contractors the amount of time that it gets wasted on tendering and it doesn't always yeah. serve the client the best either because the client may be you know they end up going for the lowest tender and then they're going to spend more money anyway because something's been missed out later on and i mean they're pricing those jobs over all the other jobs if something so we're all paying for it you know yeah so that that's not that that's not time that just disappears you know somebody has to get paid for their an estimator has to get paid to do all that and it just goes on the overheads of all the other jobs so let's say they win one in ten mm-hmm. you know the other nine so they spent five grand on each they're all getting spread around the jobs they won um in their business aren't they so yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And of course, it, you know, there's been no end of uh, stories of contractors trying to ask, you know, offer little kickbacks to architects uh, um, for, you know, bringing them in work. And obviously, that, there's all sorts of complications that arises with that. In terms I, of- I think, yeah, I think that, yeah, I mean, we would obviously we would never, never take any kickbacks or anything like that. But I think it, there's difficult because there's a kind of okay we've worked with these people successfully before mm-hmm. we're not recommending them but you know this seems like a good project for them so there's a balance in there isn't there of trying to know the market which contracts are suitable for what kind of work and and, and helping your client navigate through that because you know, clearly they're not experts in that area are they? so as you kind of visualize the future of uh, the Andy Matthews studio and the, the sorts of projects and the work that you want to go. How, how do you see the practice growing and what would be an ideal kind of size for you? And, and what are your, what are your thoughts of, about how you're getting there? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think I would avoid growth for the sake of growth, I think, mm-hmm. and, and obviously everything's driven by projects. I think we're trying to involve others into our organization. So freelancers and things to avoid, having to take people on where uh, we might not have the full pipeline to support that. Um, and I'm very conscious of if you take people on, you then your hands are tied in terms of, you know, you, obviously the work needs to come in and, and your choices and your ethical decisions might be somewhat made for you. Yes. Um, but I think, you know, one to two people a year is a, is a nice metric. Um, and I think another way of growing, we, we'd like to explore more. We have some had conversations is, is collaborating with others, you know, other practices. So, are we getting stuff, some stuff to planning and, and they take on detailed design or something, or, or are we going in with them as a team? Um, and I think as a studio environment, we have other people renting desks and so on. And I think that's a source of creativity as well. And, and, um, obviously helps, helps with some of the overheads. Um, but I think it's, it's, it depends on the direction we take with, with some of the work really. Um, but, but as, as we said before, I think competent, experienced people who enjoy doing the aspect that you're employing them for. Um, it, it is the key to our future success. Brilliant. You mentioned there working with kind of outsourcing or freelance um, mm. positions. How have you kind of, what, what, what sorts of arrangements have you found successful for you guys? Yeah. So, I mean, architects have a tendency to want to do everything, don't we? So like you know, graphic design and uh, website design and renders and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, we're not good at all that stuff. Um, and to keep at the right level to doing all those things is, is, is quite, quite an investment. So we, we have uh, a brilliant guy called Gabriel Spira in, he's in Spain at the moment who does sketch up and renders for us and helps us out. And he's always available for us. Uh, we also work with a renderer in, I think in Portugal architecture on paper, right. Both incredibly good value, always available, always turn out the goods. Um, you know, we have copywriters, PR people, other people that we plug in. Brilliant. Uh, we started using a virtual assistant uh, to help reduce the, the admin burden on me. But I think that's a smarter way of growing. Yeah. And I think, you know, the virtual assistant is a very good idea because that's somebody who enjoys doing <laughs> and they're happy to sell their time to do that. So like, great, celebrate it. I don't want to file all these emails for a very reasonable rate. This person enjoys just sorting those things out for you. Um, yeah. 
So I think uh, trying to be a bit smarter about those and, and bringing other people in where we can um, is, is, is another way of, of doing that. Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely with you there. I think the the kind of the ability for a small core team to get a lot done nowadays mm. is way easier than it's ever been before. And being able to yeah. leverage, you know, outsource, outside talent and there's all sorts of specialists and plug-in consultants yep. and people that can come in and you just pay for what they use and yep. they've got their lives and they're happy doing that and yep. you've got your life and you're happy. And it's and, and, and everyone's happy and, you know, we're, we're yep. much more au okay with working remotely and different con- continents and time zones and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we have a mentor, a business uh, consultant and accountants, all the usual thing, but they're all focusing on their core competency and doing what they love. So um, why not? Brilliant. Brilliant. Andy, I think that's a, a perfect place to conclude the conversation. Um, thank you very much. I'm very, very excited to hear uh, about the four day work week working successfully in, in a business. And I, I do think this is um, for the right businesses. This is a very powerful tool of just being able to, you know, just give more space, give more space and bring a higher level of um, a higher level of quality thought to the work that doesn't mm. get done and enjoy the time off you know, rather than this kind of marathon approach that we've had in architecture for so long the kind yeah. of short bursts of intense focus with space and you know time to rejuvenate was i think is very very effective excellent thanks so much for your time i really enjoyed talking to you my absolute pleasure thank you thanks and that's a wrap Oh yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because You see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.